Today is the last uh, sermon we're going to have uh, in the letter, Paul's letter to the Philippian church. We've been looking, inspired a little bit by this image in front of you that I saw up on Hit Mountain hiking one day, seeing one side of a tree that was dead and one that was alive, and we've been looking at the trials that we face in life. We don't have any control over those trials that come. They're going to come, we're going to realize... <laughs> I thought I had it all together, but here it comes, and I can't do anything but face it. And the way we face it means everything. If we face it trusting in the Lord, then life can come, even in the midst of suffering and trial. If we face it with bitterness, with resentment, with resistance, that leads to death, usually. So we've been looking at that and thinking about Paul's own time in writing this letter to the Philippian church. He was sitting in prison. He was facing a trial. I mean, it was difficult for him in his ministry. He's also facing the fact that he could lose his life, but he was facing it, trusting the Lord all the more. And so that was bringing life to Paul in his ministry. In the first chapter, we looked at how he faced this with gratitude. He was full of thanksgiving for the Philippian church. He was thankful that the gospel was being proclaimed even while he was sitting in prison. He was thankful, and that changed everything for his perspective on things. In the second chapter, we looked at how Paul uh, faced this kind of trial in humility as well. And he lifted up Jesus as the perfect example of humility. He lifted up Timothy. He lifted up Epaphroditus. These three people he lifts up as humble people facing trials, but they were humble about it, and therefore the Lord is exalted. In the third chapter, we looked at last week, that we are, are tempted in many ways to face trials and depend on our own strengths, our own abilities, which always <laughs> leads to disaster and loss. Instead, Paul says, when you face that kind of thing, put your faith and trust in Jesus alone, not in anything else. Everything else and everyone else will fail you, but Jesus will never fail you. So put your faith in him during trials. And then today, we're going to be looking at this last chapter in this letter and this chapter urges us to choose to rejoice in our trials. That sounds like a crazy thing to do because the last thing on our minds is to feel good about the trials we're doing, we're going through. But Paul is lifting up here joy, which brings peace. Let's pray together and then we'll read the word together. Father, thank you for your, your good and perfect word. We thank you, Father, that it has the power to reveal to us who you are and it has the power to change our lives. Father, put us today uh, under the authority of this word. Help us to have soft hearts, open minds and ears and eyes to receive your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's read this last chapter together today. Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 23. Therefore... My brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. 
In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord to us today. <clears throat> so I have said before that this letter that Paul writes to this church in Philippi, there's no other letter like it that you get this deep feeling of an intimate connection between the apostle and this church that he helped plant. Uh, he feels very close to these brothers and sisters. And in the first verse, he says again and again in different ways that. He says, therefore, stand firm. But look at how he does it. He says, my brothers, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. He says, those whom I love and long for. He loves them dearly. He wants to see them again. He feels that deeply. He says, you are my joy and my crown. This is the way he describes them. He says, stand firm in the Lord. And then he adds one more time, my beloved. You feel this really deep relationship between Paul and and this congregation that he loves dearly. He calls them family. He calls them those that bring him joy. They bring him joy even in the midst of trials. And then we're reminded again, one of the main goals of Paul's letter, it's kind of been laced throughout here, but he brings it up one more time here. One of his goals is to promote unity within the church body. Recall back in chapter 2, verse 2, when he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And then he goes on to describe Jesus and that kind of mind that he had. You can have too, he says. And so being of the same mind, being of the same spirit, being unified in body is a chief goal that Paul wants to lift up for the church here. And maybe we see here, he says, hey, you guys help me. <laughs> he says, Help these women, Euodia and Syntyche. We have no idea who these people are. But they were two, some, uh, some look at this and say these were uh, important key figures in the church. Some, maybe they just were regular old members that didn't do anything except they were fighting with each other. We don't know. We don't know who Clement is. Uh, but Paul is here saying, hey, Help these two get along. And if you go back to chapter 3 when he says in verses 3, and, or chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Could that be a little sneak at what's going on between these two? We don't know, but it could be. And Paul here says... These two labored side by side with me. They, I count them as partners in ministry here. He says, their names are in the Lamb's book of life. Look through the book of Revelation. That phrase comes up again and again and again here. He says, this is God's record of who belongs to him. These two are in that record with me and with the rest of us. So why are these two fighting? Why are they not getting along with each other? Why is that causing the rest of the congregation a little bit of heartburn? Because these two are not getting along here. He says, help them. Unity is an important thing. It's a corporate thing. It's the church as a whole. It's the whole church's responsibility to be unified. And I think in chapter 2, I was reminding us, I was just thinking about my own relationship with my wife, Elise. 
how similarly we think about so many things, but even as similarly as we think about everything, there's still some differences. <laughs> and so I look around at us, and we're supposed to have the same mind. How does that happen? Well, it's the grace of God, first of all, because there's no other way. But it takes work. It takes us denying ourselves and lifting up each other above our own needs and our own wants. It, it takes the mind of Christ to have unity here. And he says, I entreat these two ladies. I entreat you. Help them. Help them work out their differences. This isn't just their problem. It's your problem too. Work it out together. So whenever we see selfishness or conceit or arrogance or gossip pop up, Paul says, squash it right now. Don't let it grow. Don't let it get worse. The unity of the whole body of Christ here is in jeopardy if you let it go. The body of Christ is precious. And that's what Paul wants to lift up to us here and lifting up to the Philippian church. And then he says something that we have been talking about, we've been singing about today, joy and rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You know, when you say something twice, you emphasize it. When you say something twice, you emphasize it. Get what I did there? <laughs> Rejoice. Paul says, he says the word, and then he says it again. And he makes it clear. I got to tell you twice because it seems like you people are forgetting about that. It's a decision you have to make. It doesn't come naturally for us to face a trial and go, you know what, I'm going to look to the good in this right now. What is God speaking to me in this moment? Instead, we want to get bitter and angry and upset about Why is God doing this? Paul says, you know what? Rejoice in that moment. Rejoice in it. I'll say it again. It's common for parents to say that they want their kids to grow up to be happy. Maybe you've even said it yourself. Well, I'm going to be a weird parent here. I don't. I don't care if my kids grow up to be happy. Sorry, kids. What I care about is joy in their lives. Because happiness comes and goes according to whatever's happening in my life. If things are going well, I'm happy. If things aren't going well, according to me, <laughs> I'm not happy. But joy isn't like that. It's not dependent upon my life circumstances. It's not dependent on my emotions. And Paul says... He has this abundant, overflowing, life-giving joy that comes from within. He's sitting in prison. He has every reason to freak out, but he doesn't. He chooses to rejoice in the Lord. How can he do that? Why can he do that? I think the next verse tells us a little bit about that. Not there yet. <laughs> he says, okay, verse 5, the Lord is at hand. That's why he's rejoicing. There's a couple of ways we could look at this when he says the Lord is at hand. The first thing is, number one, the Lord, the righteous judge of everything, the righteous judge of all the earth, is coming back. That's one way to look at this here. Number two, he's saying God is near. I think both of those things are at work here. Both of these things are a comfort to Paul while he's in prison. That Jesus is going to return to judge the living and the dead comforts Paul because he knows Everything that's wrong is going to be set right. When these trials are over, I'll be with the Lord and all of my cares will be gone. He rejoices that the Lord is near. But also that the Lord is with Paul in his trials. Sitting there in prison is a comfort to Paul. He's not alone. And as he suffers, he knows that the Lord is enduring the suffering with him. Both of these things are a comfort to Paul. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. And because of that, Paul isn't anxious or worried about anything, and he gives everything to the God, whether it's praying for the Philippian church, pray, praying for Euodia and Syntyche and Clement here, praying about things he's concerned about, or praying full of gratitude, his prayers of thanksgiving. He gives it all to God. And he says, because of that, the peace of God, verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart's and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we should read that and don't miss the beautiful irony in what he just said. Paul is sitting in prison. Who's right outside the door? A guard. 
right? There are Roman guards standing outside the door of the prison cell that he's sitting in. He's being guarded, but Paul says, actually, the one that's really guarding me, the one that's really guarding my heart and my mind is the Lord. He says, this gives me peace beyond all understanding. I mean, he could be worried and anxious that he might be put to death while he's in jail, but the peace of God is guarding his heart and his mind. It's watching sentry over him. It's an active thing. He doesn't feel like God's just distant out there, not concerned about him. He says, I feel like God is right here with me in the cell, guarding my heart and my mind from going crazy right now. It's guarding him from worry and doubt and despair. How is that possible? I think the next couple of verses tell us a little bit more. He says, think about these things. Now, I, I had the temptation when I was reading it because it was really repetitive, whatever, this, whatever, that. And after a while, I'm like wanting to, whatever, <laughs> and just like book through it kind of quickly here. But don't. Slow down and see here these things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable. These are the things to think about. And he says, if there is anything worthy of excellence, anything worthy of praise, and one more time, remember he's saying these things like, well, duh, there is. He's like, if there is, well, there is, absolutely. There are things worthy of praise and there are excellent things. He says, think on these things. These things were highly prized in the culture of the day, but they're also highly prized by Christians. And Paul's listing of these things here reminds us that these things come from the Lord. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. If there's anything that's excellent or praiseworthy or true or honorable or noble, these things come from God, not from us. And so focusing on our minds, our, our minds on things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable, that brings peace in our hearts. That brings joy. Because these things are from God and in Him alone. So let me ask you, what are the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about, reading about, listening to? National news, world news, cultural trends, entertaining movies, troubling posts on social media by people you don't know, troubling posts by people on social media that you do know, you know, the technology available to us is this digital river of information that's ever flowing on and tempting us to try to keep up. I got to know what's going on. This new thing is happening. I got to know what's going on. And you may want a sip of information, but it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> Every time you turn on the television, listen to the radio, open the newspaper, if there's any of you archaic people out here that still read the newspaper, um, or double-click on your internet browser, you're faced with an onslaught of stuff that's troubling. Let me ask you, what if you didn't know about the latest insane piece of legislation that was just passed? What if you didn't know? What if you didn't see the post someone made on Facebook, which was actually a post by thousands of other people before that, and they just shared it? What if you didn't know? What if you didn't really know the really offensive thing that some politician or movie star said? Would your day be any worse? <laughs> what if you didn't know about the latest Biden bumble or the latest Trump accusation? What if you didn't know? I wonder, would life be a little bit more peaceful for you? Would there be more joy? I'm acting like Paul now, asking questions we already know the answers to. I'm not saying that Christians should be ill-informed. I'm not saying that. But there is a terrible temptation to try to keep up with everything that is happening all the time, 24-7, around our world and around our nation. And I've got to tell you, you can't keep up. 99% of the news you think you need to know is the opposite of what Paul is urging here. True, honorable, noble, lovely, excellent, praiseworthy. Most of the stuff that pops up is not that. I mean, just yesterday, I opened up my internet browser, and the first thing this thing came up said, woman murdered by man without pants on. I'm like, on so many levels, I don't care about this. 
But that's news. The Word of God tells us to think on things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I think all of us would greatly benefit from cutting down our intake of crazy in the world and increase our intake of things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable. Spend more time in the Word of God. Spend more time in prayer. Spend more time with each other, enjoying the fellowship of believers. Take time to rest and drink in the beauty of creation all around you. Did you see how many songs we sang about joy that were also about creation and the loveliness of everything that God made? Why did he make it beautiful and lovely? For you to look at it and to be restored and to give him the praise for it. Think about the power and majesty of God. Take time doing that. Spend time contemplating the marvelous grace of God and the gift of His beloved Son as a sacrifice for your sins. Think on these things, Paul says. <coughs> Again, I'm not saying that you need to stick your head in a hole in the ground. But I think we could do less with everything that's going on and think more about the things that are lovely that the Lord is doing. I think it brings peace when we do that. And that peace comes from the Lord, not from the world. Joy transcends our situations. It transcends our emotions. It is steady and life-giving. It's like a flowing river that ever gives life. Paul recognizes this in a very specific way that he has received peace and joy that was given to him in prison through the love and concern of the Philippian church. And now, four chapters in, he's finally made a specific point of saying this is the gift that I got from you. Epaphroditus showed up with this care package, and I'm so thankful for it, you know? I mean, besides the chocolate chip cookies you brought, and not raisins, thank you, um, you guys have encouraged me, and Epaphroditus here has taken care of me. He stayed to care for me and serve me, even though he got sick after he got here and almost died for it. I'm greatly encouraged by Epaphroditus, who came from you, Philippian Church, to encourage me. He says... I know lack and I know abundance. I've experienced both, Paul says. But he says, I'm content because I trust that God is going to provide exactly what I need when I need it. Some of that provision came from the Philippian church. And there's other times where he hasn't had it, but he trusts the Lord. And he provides everything that Paul needs. Paul knows he can face anything because the Lord strengthens him. By the way, when you read chapter 4, verse 13, and you hear that, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It has nothing to do with you uh, in your personal accomplishments. I mean, that might be part of it. Um, but really, it has to do with facing the trials and temptations of life. Christ will be with you to get you through. Think of Paul sitting in prison here, okay? Um, he feels the strength of the Lord in that moment. Paul's letter to the Philippian church ends about here. And it ends in the way that it really began, that Paul gives praise and glory to their mutual God and Father. But then there's a little postscript at the end of this, a little PS that he tacks on here. And it seems a little strange, but it's one more opportunity for Paul to remind them of the unity that they have found in Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ. And we're reminded one more time, being a Christian is not just about you and Jesus. There's a popular phrase that goes around our our nation today in Christendom saying, I, 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 don't, I don't want religion. I want a relationship. I'm like, okay, I get that. Okay? But it doesn't mean that religion itself is a worthless thing. We tend to think of religion as, well, you just attend church and then you go and it never really connects to anything else in life. But really, we're looking for this relationship, this deep, intimate relationship with God, but it's also intimately connected with one another. And Jesus answers the question, what's the greatest command? And he says, love the Lord your God with everything that you have and love your neighbor. It's connected. Loving him means loving these other people that are sitting around you here today. And for you to love them and them to love you. Intimately connected here. One more time at the end of his letter here, he says, I want to remind you about this. 
And so personally speaking today, as I prepare to step away from this post for a little while, I want to remind you of this. When Paul greets the Philippian church, he's not with them in body. He's away from them, but he feels an intimate connection with them still. I want to ask you, will you greet one another in Christ like that while I'm away? Will you remember that you are united by the blood of Jesus while I'm not here? Chapter 4, verse 3, there's this phrase. I ask you also, true companion, help these women. True yoke fellow is kind of the literal translation of that. And a yoke fellow would be somebody that you're yoked together with doing a job, doing some service, doing some work. Would you greet one another like that? Hey, we're working together. We're in this together. You're not just attending church. You are the church together. Will you greet one another like that? Will you pray for me and for my family while we're absent that God would replenish and restore and inspire me? You need to know that we're going to be praying for you. Probably the first month I'm going to be really guilty every time I pray for you all. But you are going to be on my mind. Finally, Paul says here, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm. Each time I come back, I hope to see every one of you here and to see some more people. That the work doesn't go stagnant just because your preacher isn't here, that the work will go on, that you view one another as fellow yoked people working and serving together. Stand firm in the Lord. Greet one another in the Lord's peace. And I'm going to take that opportunity too. Uh, during the next couple of months, we're going to be going to some other churches. Uh, one guy that uh, we support in ministry in LaGrande, we're going to go over there and I'm going to say, I greet you, Doug and Peggy Inman, Edmonds, in the Lord from the Middale Church of Christ. Because whether you know this guy or not, he's your true yoke fellow partnered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have no slam bang finish for this today. <laughs> and that's kind of the way Paul's letter ends here. Amen. Oh yeah, don't forget, greet one another. Don't forget that uh, the grace of Lord Jesus be with you and your spirit. Very thankful for each one of you. I'm thankful for the growth that God has brought to our congregation. And I look forward to more of what God is going to do, even in my absence. Let us pray now for the offering that we're going to take. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you have provided for us. We trust and know that you are faithful, you are good. You have given to us resources that we could never repay you for, especially the resources of your grace that are unending and your mercy that is new every day. Help us as we give to the Church of Christ here in Midvale. We ask that you would help give wisdom and discernment in the use of these funds. We ask that you would use it to further the gospel both here and abroad. We thank you for all that you have given to us. Help us to be faithful and to tithe in a way that is honoring to you with joyous, thankful hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.